Hello, my name is Sherry Harris, and this is my very good friend and clergy colleague, Cheryl Klontz. We are both Methodist pastors, and we are delighted that you are joining us on our journey through the Scripture. Uh, we are going to be looking at four men of the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at Jacob and Jonah and Joseph and Sa Samson, or as we like to call them, the dirty, rotten scoundrels. Because... They are quite the scoundrels. Yes, they are. And these are quite, quite the stories. In fact, I really want to encourage you to find you a translation of the Bible that you're comfortable with, that makes sense to you, mm. and just sit down and read them. Because whatever soap opera or reality show that you may watch or sitcom, or because there is comedy in these as well. Especially Samson. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever you watch. This is just as good. Um, so take the time to actually read through. Some of these are relatively long. Jacob's 11 chapters. Joseph, they actually call it a novella. Mm -hmm. um, so m most of these are at least a short story. Uh, but well worth your time. Just experience the story. Because part of why God tells us these stories in the Bible is not just that we can reflect on what people did back then. But also that through their stories, we can see how God transforms people and allow God to restory our lives. I love that phrase, restory. Re well, so why don't you tell us about our first little scoundrel, Jacob? Oh, so Jacob. And so I've got to tell you that Jacob means an awful lot. This story means an awful lot to me. I actually have a picture in my office of Jacob wrestling with the angel. Oh, okay. And it was given to me as a gift. Uh, when I was in the process of responding to my call to ministry mm. because I struggled with God. So this is a story that really speaks to me. Uh, but it's a long story. So we're, we've, we're going to confess we have actually struggled to make this short. Mm. and not We're, to, we're just going to give you the high points. That's why it's so important you read the story. Because it's such a great story. Um, and so we're going to just focus, when we're talking about Jacob, we're going to focus on the theophanies. And we'll talk about that in a minute, mm. uh, where he encounters God. Um, but it begins as a story of sibling rivalry. It ends as a story of sibling rivalry. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of that going on in Scripture, if you pay attention. And it will continue with a story of sibling rivalry uh, between Jacob and his brother Esau. Uh, that results, short, short version, it results in Jacob, because he's tricked his brother mm -hmm. out of the inheritance, Jacob is running away for fear that his brother is going to kill him. Mm -hmm. um, and in running away, he is running to his mother's family. And as he does that, he finds himself in the middle of nowhere where God does show up. I used to have a, a worship leader who would always say to me, Pastor Cheryl, God shows up today. <laughs> and I would say, but but God is always with up. us. <laughs> he shows up every day. And he would say, but okay, then Pastor Cheryl, God showed up and showed out today. <laughs> well, in this story, God shows up and shows out. Um, we call this a theophany. This mm -hmm. is a big theological word, which means an appearance of God to a human. Mm -hmm. um, and it's different than, you may have heard the term epiphany, you know, which sometimes it's like that light goes off in right. our head. Um an epiphany is generally a revelation in scripture is a revelation of God to everyone. Mm -hmm. But a theophany is a personal experience of God. So God showing up for the person then. Um, and generally God shows up to build the relationship and to move the story forward. Mm -hmm. So what happens is Jacob is running away. He goes to sleep in the middle of the desert. He, he actually uses like a stone for his pillow. Mm -hmm. And while he's doing this, in the middle of the night, he has a dream. And in the dream, uh, we generally, you may have heard reference to Jacob ladders. Or there, mm -hmm. There's even a little children's toy. In the dream, he sees a ladder that's going to heaven. And there's angels going up and down this ladder. And then, in most translations, it says he looks up and he sees God at the top of this, of this ladder. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting is actually that word that says up could also be translated beside. Oh. And I just love this image that, that he's there and he sees these angels going up and down. And then it's as if instead of God being way up there, God is right beside him, almost mm -hmm. maybe like going Hey, Jacob. Yeah. Pay attention. Um, pay attention. Pay attention. <laughs> I've got something to tell you. So when he wakes up, um, 
he realizes that God, he said, in fact, he says this, God was in this place uh-huh. and I did not know it. Mm. That should resonate into our lives oh, as well. Oh my goodness, when I think of the many times, um, I think Soren Kierkegaard said that, you know, we live life forward, but we understand life backwards. Mm-hmm. And and Jacob does this again and again, where at the end of these experiences, he looks back and goes, I didn't realize God was in this, but my goodness, God was here the whole time. Um, so he says, God was in this place, and I did not even know it. And so he names the place Beth El, which is house of God. And he promises, this is because he's the trickster, right? Mm-hmm. Always. He's always the trickster. She'll share with you some more of that. But he promises God that if God will take care of him, if God will take care of him, right. and will bring him back, then God will be his Lord. Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. Talk about <laughs> unconditional surrender <laughs> to God. This, I mean. this is not I surrender all. It's like, okay, God, I'm going to give you a little bit. And if you prove yourself, I'll yeah. give yourself I've a little bit. I've got a list bit. here that you, that you <laughs> yeah. can go down. That's our Jacob. That's, That's our, our Jacob. Jacob. <laughs> well, he, um, he leaves the place, the house of God. He does go to his mother's family. And he falls crazy in love with the beautiful Rachel. And so he agrees to work for seven years to be able to marry Rachel. This is a, a kind of a, a con- contract he has between Rachel's himself and Rachel's father, Laban. But now here's the part that I, I think is just kind of funny and, and ironic. Um, Laban tricks him into marrying uh, Rachel's older sister, Leah. So the trickster was tricked. <laughs> um, he has to work another seven years to marry Rachel. Uh, and now we have a very messy story because we have a man married to two sisters, one who was less desired and not as beautiful and one who was beautiful and was first choice after all. Uh, Leah has a high card. She can have children. Rachel cannot. And so there's all this tension. You can just imagine all this tension. Even the Kardashians have nothing Oh, else. yeah. They, <laughs> they, they put them to shame. They, they put really, them to shame. Really, really do. definitely. So uh, eventually, Leah has, I believe, six children by Jacob. But both of the women have servants. And in that day and time, it was, it was okay to have a, quote, child by your servant. So uh, each servant has two children. Think Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, think Handmaid's Tale. That's a great way to yep. look at it. So, um, but eventually the beautiful Rachel does have a son and this first son is named Joseph and we're going to be talking about him later on as well. But, uh, this, uh, this is a blended family at its most complicated and that's going to show up later. So fast forward 20 years and, uh, Jacob decides he's ready to come home. Uh, the trickster, once again, tricks his um, Uncle Laban out of the best sheep and the mm-hmm. best goats, and he heads home to Canaan. And that's where he has his second experience of God directly. Once, mm-hmm. once again, he doesn't know what's going on, and he's running away. This time, he's running away from Laban and back towards his brother Esau. Is, mm-hmm. This is the, the one who wanted to kill him. The let's one not, that wanted to kill him. Let's not but now that. the brother-in-law wants to kill him. He's running back to his brother. And actually, it's kind of funny, too, because, I mean, he is the trickster, right? So he divides out the groups. He mm-hmm. divides out his family, and he sends the least favorite wife and her kids first. first yeah. <laughs> Rachel's at the very back. At the very back. <laughs> and he's at the very, very back. <laughs> <laughs> so so he's, he sends them on. He, he's uh, he's at, this, this river, at this riverside, and he, once again, he's, he's going to go to sleep mm-hmm. when this, uh, the scripture says an angel. Mm-hmm. or a man shows up and they have a wrestling match all night long all night long that all night long and actually Jacob is winning the wrestling match mm-hmm. and he was probably cheating knowing he Jacob pr- he probably was <laughs> cheating <laughs> and and I've and it I, I kind of envision it like he's got this this guy down on the ground, mm-hmm. and it says that this angel reaches up and touches him in the hip area uh-huh and that actually wounds him, mm-hmm. and he has to stop. And that's when he finds out that this was not just any angel. Mm-hmm. This was not just any man he'd been struggling with. This was God. Mm-hmm. And he gets renamed. He gets renamed from Jacob to Israel. And Israel means he who struggles with God. 
Uh, we should all be named Israel, shouldn't we? Well, we the children of God, God. <laughs> are, they're called the children of Israel mm-hmm. because they are the ones. And if you read through the Old Testament, they're continually struggling with God. Mm-hmm. Um, and he who struggles with God and the angel leaves. He doesn't leave Jacob untouched by the experience. He leaves Jacob with a limp that he's mm-hmm. going to have for the rest of his life. Um, but he also gives him a blessing. And so Jacob names this place Peniel, which means face of God, oh. because he says he came face to face, face with, with God, God and lived. And that's when he continues on. He actually also at that point promises to give a tithe. That's where mm-hmm. the, he, well, it's not where the tithe orig- originally comes from, but in response to what God has done for him, he's going to give 10% of what he has. He gives a tithe back. He's going to give a tithe back to God because he is the trickster. He can't just accept what God has given him. He's yeah. got to, he's got to have something to give back or Doesn't to feel familiar sound. Yeah. To, to feel like some, he's got some sort of hook with God, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there's just, uh, then he goes back mm-hmm. to Esau. He goes back to Esau, and much to his surprise, Esau forgives him and welcomes him home. So uh, once again, the trickster is tricked. This was not what Absolutely. he was expected. But um, so, Cheryl, I mean, this is such a deep, rich, incredible story. What can we learn from Jacob? What can he teach us? Well, there is so, there is so much in this story. This is why I really want to encourage you to read it, because... I always go back to these theophanies simply mm-hmm. because it meant so much to me in my own life. Sure. I, I've struggled with, there was a time in my life when I struggled with whether or not I, I believed in God, that I believe God really exists. There was a time when I struggled with my call. So Jacob, really, I, although I don't think I've ever been a trickster, no. hopefully never She's a trickster. She's not a trickster. <laughs> I've known her a long time. She's not I, a I have struggled with what I believe about God. Mm. But don't you think we all do? I think we all do, and mm-hmm. I think depending on what happens in our lives, that we can. Some people have a more severe mm-hmm. or a a, a harder. A rest, some people wrestle all night. Some will only wrestle for a short period of time. Right. Let's put it that way. Okay. So, I think he he reminds us first off that we often miss signs of God being present with us mm-hmm. at the time. I mean, as, as clergy, I, I'm sure you hear this a lot when people go, I, I don't see where God's at work in this. And sometimes it, you, it's like you mentioned in that quote already, you kind of have to have the perspective of looking backwards and saying, oh, God was right there and right there and right there. And that's why in the Christian tradition, one of the disciplines that they've always encouraged is what they call the daily examine, mm-hmm. which is at the end of the day, going back and looking at your day. Because sometimes that's the way you see God Mm -hmm. at work. It's not when you're in the midst of it, but when you look back and you go, oh, my gosh, I was having this horrible day. And my friend Sherry called me (laughs) to encourage me. Um, And that wasn't Sherry calling me. That was God calling Mm -hmm. me. So as Kierkegaard said, life can only be understood forwards. But I mean, excuse me, back can only be understood backwards, even though we have to live it forward. Absolutely. So spending time to journal or at least to think through your day Mm -hmm. and to recognize where God has been present in your day. I I think that's an important thing we can learn. Oh, I think it's a very important spiritual discipline. Uh, The other thing I think it means is that our struggles with God are not, well, they are problems, but God does not despise us for our struggles. No, no, absolutely Um, not. It's not wrong to question God. In fact, God appreciates our willingness to struggle. And our willing to struggle with God comes out of our trust in God. Mm-hmm. And, and the fact that we want that deeper relationship we want that with God. De- absolutely. You know, some people often uh, misquote 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Oh, my gosh. You know, as God won't put anything on you, you can't bear, which is not what 1 Corinthians no. 13 says. First off, it's talking about temptation. Mm-hmm. But even if it was talking about that, it says God is faithful and God will not let you be tested beyond your strength, but with the testing will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it, which means that whatever happens to you in your life, you in and of yourself may not be strong enough to hold mm-hmm. that, that burden, but God, with God, you can endure. Which is a completely different meaning. Absolutely. I, I was in a training just this past weekend, and she was talking about uh, resilience. And mm-hmm. sometimes we think of resilience as just endurance. Mm-hmm. But resilience is actually being able to move forward. And when we know that God is with us, we can move forward. We no matter just what en- is going right. on in our lives. We don't just endure. We can move forward. Um, 
And so God doesn't admonish Jacob for his struggle. Instead, he gives him a new name and a blessing. And I think if you read Jacob's story uh, and really let God speak into your heart through this story, uh, you will learn quite a bit from this dirty, rotten scoundrel that we call Jacob. Yes.